introduction on uh, yeah, the development of new glasses and what are the, the current challenges uh, of our domain. Uh, glasses, unfortunately, is uh, hampered by very inefficient trial and error design discovery methods, and it's because it lacks crucial access to consistent information. Um, this is because like, the, the glass production process is very much uh, yeah, focused on details and uh, nuance, but it's hard to report all of these details in a, in a formal manner. And that's why we can't really build any models on the process parameters, but they are the most important information we got. And on top of that, we have uh, yeah, lots of complex property relationships because of the disordered nature of our material. So if you're an experimentalist or material scientist working with machine learning, uh, what are the sources of information that you can work with? So first of all, yes, of course, the composition. It, is, it might seem consistent, but it's, it's really not because uh, oftentimes you have quite a few volatiles uh, in your glass composition, which is why um, you end up with a completely different product that you uh, yeah, batch the oven with. And on top of that, there's a limited impact on the properties um, because yeah, you can have a fully crystallized material and a glass with the same composition, but you have no idea how we ended up at one of either. So. The second uh, important information is, of course, the glass structure, but it's hard to access on a large scale. So if you're an experimentalist and you want to do like thousands or tens of thousands uh, of investigations on glass structure, you need to perform a lot of IR or Raman or NMR spectra. So this is not quite feasible. And there's, of course, a lot of inhomogeneous uh, surfaces and bulk uh, materials because sometimes you want to introduce some kind of stress within your glass or some kind of uh, chemical gradient from the inside to the outside or the other way around. So it's, yeah, quite hard. Uh, the, best <laughs> uh, the best source of information to focus on is therefore the process parameters, but we have a lack of yeah, sufficient data uh, and it's yeah, expected to have a very high impact on the properties. So our first approach was to try to get as much information out of the composition as possible. And uh, we, we did a quite straightforward approach by using yeah, up initial descriptors. There isn't really an Oxford dictionary definition or a trademark on this word. It's just a, yeah, uh, interchangeable with composition weighted average of glass constituent properties. So we did a bunch of DFT calculations for glass constituents such as SO2 or sodium oxide. And we then just build a property database out of that and weight the glass constituents accordingly to their more percentage within the glass. So we have a rough first estimate. It's a, again, very simple, straightforward approach of our glass. Um, what we did uh, to verify the yeah, feasibility was to use a very common benchmark for glass science. It's the Cyglass data set. You might now say, well, <laughs> we, we have a large scale data set, but the Cyglass data set is very uh, dated. It had a sort of corrupted information within it. And it's yeah, also not uh, covering process parameters. Um, but we could show that um, with this benchmark, we could achieve similar results with our initial descriptors than uh, we have with the compositional descriptors. Um, from a yeah, other experimentalist group, we also got a yeah, very small scale database because right now, since we have no comprehensive large scale data sets, uh, we tried to yeah, fulfill the needs, needs of these people. So we got from the Mondrachek group a strain sensitivity database that covers only 340 entries with 57 unique components. And it covers not only oxide glasses, but also a lot of metallic glasses and chalcogenite glasses. Uh, and we could show that we uh, yeah, got at least a bit of a performance increase uh, for throughout our models, for the exception for the new networks, because we believe that yeah, only seven up initial scripters and only 340 entries is uh, not flexible enough for for this type of machine learning model. But since this is a, is a very inexpensive method, once you obtained all your DFT calculations, um, yeah, you can always give it a shot as an experimentalist. And what we find, found out during our yeah, process uh, was that uh, we could enable expandability without retraining our models um, because uh, in this up initial descriptor space, we have one common input space for uh, all types of glass compositions. And we're now yeah, exploring what kind of applications we can, uh, yeah, we can explore with that. Yeah, moving on to the second um, source of information, the structural descriptors. As I said, usually you get access to the glass structure as an experimentalist through IR, NMR, or Raman spectrum, but this is not automated. At least it's not automated yet. We have a experimentalist group as our partners that are working on 
building some fancy robot facilities to, <laughs> to do that. But as of right now, we can't really work with that. So we need simulations once again. And um, to build upon existing, informa uh, existing information is also quite difficult because usually people are interested in some very specific systems, some very specific properties, and you can't really build a very dense uh, input space out of that, obviously. Um, so our idea was, um, why not remove our bias from the equation and uh, let a machine decide <laughs> to uh, interpret what defines a glass structure. And yeah, but first I want to talk about the uh, simulations, of course, we want to use MD, or we are using MD simulations to build a, uh, next to the experimental data pipeline, we want to build a simulation data pipeline um, that is continuously feeding our database with uh, information. So we're randomly generating structures according to the glass composition. And um, yeah, depending on the target property, we are starting with about like 50,000 simulations. The cells as of right now cannot be too large and the simulation protocol cannot be too extensive because we have only so much time, right? And yeah, uh, throughout this conference, there were a lot of fancy um, yeah, force field methods presented, but since we wanted to keep it simple and straight at the beginning, and uh, we are using a very common force field within the field of glass science, the force field according to Pedona et al. Uh, but later on, we can yeah, fancy up on that part. <laughs> All right, so our idea to extract the structure from our, or to extract the information from our structures are better variational autoencoders. There have been quite a few talks about variational autoencoders, so I don't want to spend too much time on what they are what, or what they are doing. Um, the key difference is this yeah, better. So we want to ensure that the latent space is as disentangled as possible, so we have as as non-correlated latent factors as possible. Um, this, of course, is uh, on the expense of the reconstruction error. So we probably won't have as, as good of a reconstruction as without the beta. But by talking to experimentalists, this does not need to be a disadvantage for glasses, since um, to an extent, we, we do want to have some variability in the reconstruction of our, uh, yeah, of our disordered structures. So, since throughout our uh, yeah, data pipelines from the simulations and the experiments, we expect to have a very dense uh, input space. We expect to have uh, yeah, continuous latent factors, that, which are yeah, very exciting in our opinion, because uh, we can then attribute these latent factors to some kind of properties. As of right now, um, since we are in the process of doing this, <laughs> we don't know if these uh, latent factors are physical or non-physical, but either way, um, we're looking forward to have some some kind of yeah, unbiased insight into the glass structure and find some way to create maybe some generative model or some preview throughout yeah, our glass systems. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much time I have left or how much time I spent. Yeah, so I want to <laughs> thank my, um, yeah, my supervisor, Marek Zirka, and uh, of course the German federal government for funding this project and also all the project partners from Klausthal, Würzburg, Jena, and Berlin, especially Berlin, who are building these awesome robotic facilities. And yeah, I want to by that conclude my talk. Thank you, Felix. How about questions for Felix? Yes, Antti. Thank you for your presentation. I have one quick question about this. So glasses are amorphous materials. So what kind of challenges this uh, introduces compared to, for example, these crystalline materials for applying this, your methods? Yeah, well, in the, in the field of crystallized materials, you often can work with symmetries or representation of symmetries as we have seen throughout this conference. And for glasses, to an extent, we have some uh, short range order or medium range order, but there's no long range order and, and we can't really use yeah, methods of uh, symmetry to, to that extent. So uh, yeah, that's why there's, there's a need of alternative methods and also for the inclusion of process parameters because we need to somewhat work on a larger scale than yeah, lots of the molecular guys. <laughs> I have a question here. Um, could you just go back to your slide with your autoencoder um, diagram? So do I understand correctly you you want to encode and decode the entire unit cell, not just individual environments at a time? Yes, the entire cell. Okay, okay, gotcha. And does it work or are you, are you not there yet? 
well, we're not there yet. We have uh, trouble to set up this uh, simulation pipeline in a way that we can scale it easily and we have a reliable output. And yeah, so we're not there yet, but this is the, the idea. <laughs> yeah, very exciting. Good luck. Okay, any further questions? Yes. What are the tricks uh, you, you would use to account for periodicity in the unit cell? What are the tricks uh, needed or is it natural to account for the periodicity of the unit cell? Um, like we, we lack periodically, uh, periodic, uh, we, we don't have uh, periodic structures like, like we do, but we have uh, disordered structures. But uh, in my group, some other people showed that for polymer materials, like at, at a later point, we could uh, do uh, more calculations for the same glass and thereby generate uh, yeah, larger cells because we can just stitch them together and we have some inherent variability because of the randomly generated structures. So I think maybe, what was that your question even? <laughs> yeah. You might be out encoding the finite size effect if you don't. Uh... Yeah, yeah. We, we want to encode more of the same compositions, but also more other compositions, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. OK, that seems like I can ask my question, which is about variational autoencoders. And I'm very interested in latent spaces. Have you looked inside your latent space? And have you, have you looked into? Um, where your structures are in latent space or any kind of just qualitative analysis? In our latent space or? No, yes, not yet. Very much. <laughs> okay, that, that's maybe in the next meeting. Yeah, for sure. Any last questions for Felix? If not, let's uh, give him a hand and all the speakers of our session today. Thank you very much. And next, I think we have our panel discussion. So am, am I right? This is the 